Hello and welcome to a series of conversations we're having on constitutional governance in Sri Lanka. And to kick things off, we have with us uh, Dr. Pakisodi Saravanamuthu, the executive founding executive director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives. Hello, Dr. Saravanamuthu. Hello. I'm going to start off by asking you, we're going to talk about the political background to the current crisis. And I'm going to start off with asking you what the immediate and proximate dynamics of politics and governance that led Sri Lanka to the current economic crisis. Well, basically what we have is a crisis of governance. It has a political dimension to it as well as an economic dimension. So let's leave the economic dimension aside because there are particular decisions that we can point to. But if you look at the political dimensions, the political and constitutional dimensions, I think a key factor is the institution of the executive presidency, where you have all powers consolidated in a single office and you don't really have recourse to any checks and balances as such. We tried with the 19th Amendment, that didn't work out because we got the 20th, but even the 19th Amendment didn't go to the heart of the matter. What we have done, and Jaya Jaya Watner, I think, envisaged this in 1978, is to create an almighty president at the top of the apex of power that no one could challenge. And I guess his argument was that there would be certainty, that there would be continuity, that you wouldn't have the changes, the big changes when you voted in one government and then five years later voted in another government. So I think the question of the executive president is absolutely pertinent to the political crisis that we have at the present moment. And you saw that, look, we either could get rid of him by him resigning or impeaching him, which would have taken a tremendous number of year, months, and public pressure. And that too had to be mounted over a period of what, something like three months. Before we talk more about the executive presidency, can you also tell me if there are any historical causes in terms of political culture or leaders or institutions even since independence? Oh yes, very definitely. I mean, I think the political culture in this country is one of sort of clientelism insofar as those in office are then expected to provide for the citizenry. And there is that culture of entitlement. If you look at Sri Lanka, every public service is heavily subsidized. Furthermore, we have what, 1.5 million or whatever it is in the public service. So you are born, you get a free education, you get free health, and then you get a job in the public service if you wish to go there, and you're taken, in effect, taken care of from cradle to grave. And there is this notion that the government has to look after you. And there is a notion, therefore, that at the top of the pile, the president is the key person in charge of looking at, looking after you. So we have to break that culture. When we talk about equality before the law, the rule of law and all of that, there's almost subconsciously a sort of notion that the president is exempt from it. But now what the Aragalea has done, I think, is to try to break that paradigm and bring in a paradigm whereby you have a rule of law, you have equality before the law. You don't have to look up to individuals who are then supposed to provide for you. But it's great that you came from the people. Absolutely. What are the governance dimensions to recovery from the economic crisis? What kind of reforms do you think are necessary? Well, I mean, therefore, I would argue that the key reform with regard to the governance dimension is to abolish the executive presidency. And I think the government that we have should come out with a timetable of when the presidency is going to be abolished. And it would require a two-thirds majority because it'll, it's a constitutional amendment. So you pass it in parliament. And then the day that you go for a general election, and you should go for that fairly soon, is also the day that you can hold the referendum uh, in, in the country at large. But that is necessary, but not sufficient. So if you abolish the executive presidency, that means you move to parliament as the main site or location of governance. And therefore, you also have to strengthen the checks and balances, oversight committees. You know, there is a parliamentary tradition whereby these committees are headed by members of the opposition. But in Sri Lanka in the last uh, decade or so, we've changed all of that. We've turned parliament into an entirely supportive rubber stamp 
of executive authority. I mean, we had a time when what the vast majority, I think, bar three or four, uh, was ministers of some shape or form. That has to go. We have to have those strict divisions. So the parliamentary, the committee system, the oversight committees have got to be strengthened. But even before that, it's also about what we do to ensure that we get the right people, quote unquote, into parliament and that the elections are held on an equal ground, on fair play, you know. And so we need to bring in laws with regard to campaign finance. I think that's tremendously important. So we have a transparent law. We have the integrity of the electoral system protected and strengthened. And we also move away from this almighty executive. Right. On the surface of things, we have an economic issue, like an e economic crisis. But what is the role of democracy and human rights in economic re recovery? Well, the first point is this, is that, look, the people who suffer as a consequence of this economic crisis is the general population. Now, the general population, in terms of the measures that are going to be taken to rectify this, even the solution, they are going to have to swallow bitter medicine. So what they need, therefore, is a government who will have that conversation with them, inspire trust and confidence in them, and tell them, look, this is why we are doing this. This is what we are doing. So you have to, we all have to tighten our belts and get behind and do this together. Because otherwise, we are going to have tremendous social unrest. If you have a government that is deemed to be illegitimate, lacks credibility, then when all of the sacrifices and the more sacrifices that people have to bear, when they do kick in, it's going to be quite uh, tumultuous. Wouldn't an argument be made that you need a strong government at this time? Yes. What is strong government? That is the question. For me, strong government is government that's legitimate, that's credible, that listens to the people, that doesn't overreach itself in terms of power and authority. Strong government is not government that sends out the intelligence services and the security services to stifle dissent. Strong government is not one that sort of says to the people, look, y'all don't understand what debt restructuring is about and all of that. Therefore, we can't tell you that. Just bear with us. Take it for granted that we know what we're doing. That's not strong government. And that's anti-democratic, in my opinion. You have to have that conversation with the people and carry them along to provide the legitimacy for what you are doing. Right. So what, in your opinion, is the pathway to democratization and good governance? Yes. Yeah, so now in Sri Lanka, now we have a new president who is going to serve out the unexpired term of Gotabe Rajapaksa. So we have... On the economic front, we have to get the staff agreement with the IMF. But in the meantime, we have to get the bridging finance. We have to make sure that there is enough money for fuel and petrol and the health and all of those things. All of that has got to be done. But at the same time, that conversation that I mentioned earlier has to be carried out with the people so that they know what the government is doing and why they're doing it. And with regard to that, a communication strategy on the part of the government is tremendously important. You can't have a president saying one thing, then another minister saying something else, and another minister saying something else. It has to be a clear, coherent message. Now, in order to do that, I think in the next two and a half years, there are certain political reforms that can be brought in. People say that we can't have an election and all of that. I think that's absolute nonsense. The government can float bonds and get uh, pay for an election. So. We need to bring in legislation for the abolition of the executive presidency. They're talking about bringing the 19th Amendment, now called the 22nd Amendment, and all of that. But if you remember, the Vijayadasa uh, Rajpaksa Amendment talked about all of these things happening in the next parliament. So I don't know whether that is going to change. You know? So without you know, just faffing around, as it were, we need to get to the heart of the matter. And that is pruning the powers of the executive presidency. You know, sometimes they sort of say that, look, in a dire national emergency, you need to be able to declare emergency and all of that. I mean, how on earth did we manage before 1978 
we also had emergencies, you know. So there isn't any compelling argument, in my opinion, that an executive presidency is needed to maintain political stability, to maintain political legitimacy, to underpin the serious economic and social reforms that we have to undertake. We can do it with the parliamentary system. Right. In the longer term, uh, beyond the term of the current um, government and parliament, what and how do you see the political and economic outlook for the country? Well, if the reforms are taken, are introduced and implemented, then I think people in the Aragalea might actually give this government some time. If not, we will get them out on the streets again. And what I mean by that is, if the government is deemed to be illegitimate, lacking credibility, if it is not talking to the people, then when they have to make more sacrifices, they are going to come out. And it's not going to be just golf face located or golf face centered. It is going to be the spontaneous outpouring of dissent and frustration and indeed anger outside. Yeah. So we need to make those political reforms because those are part, they are pivotal to the demands of the Aragalea in general that we change the system of governance in this country. We make it more democratic and inclusive and representative. So those political reforms on the one hand, as well as the economic reforms which will entail sacrifice. If we don't do that, then we are faced with further political instability. The IMF negotiations will be delayed, if not derailed. And God knows where we will go, just further down the precipice. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Saran Muthu. We will continue this conversation again. Thank you.